Now that in itself is not that funky. What's funky is actually how I mounted it. Hey, what's up reefers? I figured today we will do a 45 gallon tank update. It has been a while and a lot has changed. Recently, I started looking into revamping the 45 gallon and kind of get brushed up on my reef keeping skills before the 150 gallon tank is up and running. And there's three areas that I've really looked into. Number one, I look into coral nutrition. Number two, I look into water chemistry. And number three, I look into the life support, which is a light and a pump and stuff like that. And through this two months, I learned a whole lot. There's so much you can do when you do not sleep at night and you just find things to listen to and read. So I started implementing a lot of the changes. The first thing I wanted to tackle is coral nutrition because I really never paid attention to this arena and oh my God, it was so important. I'm lucky because around me, there are a lot of knowledgeable people that can kind of point, point me to the right path and they're not pushy about it. But when I want to learn more, they are ready to give me advice. So what I'll do is like, I'll continue to revamp the 45 gallon tank and use it almost like a model for the 150 gallon tank when it's up and ready to go. Down the road, as I start learning more and more of this different segments I'm gonna put out videos that showed you guys what I learned so if you are a beginner reef keeper or even intermediate reef keeper watch out for those videos because I think those videos will be really informative and really interesting for topics I cannot speak confidently on I think what I'll do is I'll point some of the expert and let them share their experience so you're actually hearing somebody that has walk this path before and not just somebody who's walking this path with you like I am with you right now. If you cannot tell, I'm really excited because like this is uncharted territory for me. Uh, for the most part, my reef tank has been just kind of on autopilot. I've never really paid attention to specific parameters. And man, let me tell you, the corals really reacted positively once I started addressing these points. So be on the lookout for the series. You can call it like appropriate reefing 101 series or something like that. Anyways, today we're gonna take a look at the 45 gallon tank just to see where this right now i like to do this so we have a snapshot to see where this tank is right now and then we'll compare it maybe a couple months down the road once these different methods has been implemented to see how it has changed so without further ado i've rambled long enough let's go oh i know one of you guys are gonna ask what happened to the 150 gallon tank well by the time you're watching this um it is either already plumped or is being plumped at this very moment. So be on the lookout on Instagram. Most likely I'll be posting photos on there on the progress as well. So it is moving forward, but check this out. Isn't this mobile awesome? <laughs> All right, onto the video. All right, guys, I promise to keep things snappy this time. So let's dive right in, shall we? Let's start with the biggest thing in the tank first and then we'll go downwards. First of all, if we take a step back, we'll see almost half the tank is being taken up by the rose bubble tip anatomy. This thing has grown to a monster. Let me uh, remove the mesh top, which I still need to re replace the mesh with. Uh, the mesh I got is actually right here. But anyways, we'll talk about that in a different video. But let's look from the top. We'll see that this guy has gotten large. So large that I have been evacuating the corals around the anemone just to make sure that it's not being stung by an anemone. Ever since I removed the frog spawn, it has totally just taken over the rock and just seems a lot happier. So there's something to be said about providing enough space for corals. Uh, I should not be saying it because right now I'm kind of fighting for space. And that's the next thing we should probably talk about. But before then, I want to point out, since we're on the topic of anemones, there's the Belly Mini Max Anatomy. I actually got three of them in this tank and two of them just kind of like wander off somewhere else. I'm not sure where they went. They were in a specimen container up here before. Uh, I've since removed them and then put them in onto this piece of rock. So one of them actually wandered off onto that piece of rock and overnight it disappeared. I'm hoping that it did not fell into the rolls of an anatomy. That would suck. Anyways, let's talk about real estate a little bit because I did something a little bit funky. Um, as you can see, all this area got cleared up by the bubble tip and anemone. There's nowhere else to go. So in the last couple months, I've been mounting more and more SPS onto the um, back left glass and also the overflow. And I'll show you, they are actually doing quite decent. Like I mentioned in the intro, I'm looking into uh, revamping this 45 gallon tank in terms of um, coral nutrition, water chemistry, as well as the life support. And I've really been diving into the coral nutrition aspect, uh, especially this past month. And all the SPS really responded well with it. Um, before I have zero nitrate, zero phosphate, thought it's no big deal, but apparently it is a huge deal. And as a result, I do actually believe um, before the frog spine was really piled out and was uh, receding, I feel like that may be one 
big factor as well. But again, that's actually for the next video. In this case, all we need to know here is that SPS is doing really well. So I got inspired. I look over there on the right side, I was like, hmm, I got some room and the, uh, and the hammer coral in the 10 gallon is uh, not really doing too well. It is not too happy upstairs. So I figured let's move it down here. I couldn't find any space. Um, and that's when I started moving to the right. Now that in itself is not that funky. What's funky is actually how I mounted it. It looks like a nice little cluster of hammer coral, but it's actually two. Because of the uh, skeleton of the hammer coral is so long, it's really hard to place. So what I ended up doing, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably have known this already, is I actually fragged up different branches and then I actually super glued uh, two of the branches here, two of the larger branches right here, and it mounts it onto a magnet. And I just kind of place it on top of the mounting cap. It's like a, it's like a nice platform, so it does not rotate. On the other side, there's more of this hammer coral. And this one you can see clearly, I super glued two of the branches together so that I get a nice little cluster that'll fit nicely in that little crevice right there. So it's not taking up too much room and it's not like butt up right up to each other. They have room to spread out a little bit more. I feel like that's kind of funky. I have not seen people super gluing skeletons together. Uh, and on top of that, to mount it right on the glass, but hey, you know, let's give it a try. And this actually brings me to my next point. There are a lot of questions about magnets, especially what magnet is reef safe. I feel like the jury is still kind of out on that one. There's two types of magnets that I use in this tank. One is these coated one from um, K and J that a lot of people have been using. Uh, but the danger is that once the coating, the epoxy coating crack, right inside you have like copper, nickels, and different heavy metal that you don't want in your reef tank. So a lot of people kind of shy away from it. However, a lot of people have also been using these for years with no issue at all. But uh, some people told me that if you want to be safe, go for ceramic magnet inside the tank if you can. And that's what these are um, inside. These are the Home Depot ceramic magnets. Now recently, another thing that came out, somebody reached out to me saying that, hey, I use ceramic magnet and it rusted in my tank. So I feel like not all ceramic magnet is created equal. These are the ones from Home Depot. I've been keeping an eye out on them. Uh, I believe they've been in this tank for probably at least some of the older ones are probably like five, four or five months now. And I've been checking them regularly to make sure no funky business is happening. Like th these guys right here, it's also ceramic rat magnets. So there's no rust developing. So I think that should be okay. Because of like this kind of un unknown, uh, unknown nature of magnets, I'm hesitant to recommend using magnet to mount frag unless of course you're kind of like an inappropriate reefer. You want to just uh, just risk it, just take a risk, right? Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. In terms of copper actually, since we're talking about heavy metal, see how I kind of segue right there? I feel pretty good about the copper situation. I ran copper sorb uh, two packs and none of them changed color. So meaning that that's, it did not pull out any large amount of copper. Um, if any. So I do have my ATI ICP test on the ready. Um, so after I finish messing with the chemistry of this tank, I'm gonna do another test of ATI ICP. And again, I really like the ATI uh, ICP test compared to the other one simply because the result is easy to read and the recommendation they give you is really actionable. But we'll go a little deeper into this once we get to the water chemistry section of the 45 gallon revamp. Okay, so now we talk about the largest things in the tank, um, building upwards in the tank because we're out of room down here. Look at this clam. The clam has really grown. Since I started messing with the uh, water chemistry and the coral nutrient, I think it really benefited. The growth ring started getting much larger again. Oh man, okay, I spooked it. <laughs> uh, but here's a, here's a good opportunity to look at the growth ring. So I feel like it kind of plateaued maybe a couple, couple months ago. That's when I was starting to have all those issue with uh, uh, LPS. And once I started looking at my nutrients a little bit closer to make sure nitrate and phosphate is no longer zero, uh, this guy seems happy. Well, of course, I also started dosing more. And some of the other corals that really was affected, actually, you know what? Most corals are affected by the ex, uh, extra nutrient. But some of the corals that's extra happy are these acans right here. If you guys remember, there's a stretch of time that I just struggled with the acans. And hindsight, I feel like maybe it's the zero phosphate that really did them in. They're happy, they're puffy, nice, but not all corals are happy with this arrangement. Look at the cetosis right there. See how it's all bleached out right there? So I think this is one of the uh, casualties of all the changes I'm doing to this tank. Um, but besides the cetosis, everything else seems okay. Hi, what's up? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Good morning. You want to say hi to people? No, no, my 
no, okay. One change that some of you may notice is that, oh, the front of the tank looks a lot emptier. Um, and that is because if you notice the finger ladder, it used to be a lot larger, right? Half of it, well, two thirds of it got transferred to the back. When you take a step back and take a look at the tank, um, before it was a big chunk of stuff right here blocking a lot of anemones, um, which actually it looks decent, but it's getting a little bit too much. So I just decided to kind of split the colony and place some in the back to kind of give the tank a little bit of the depth. So when you look at the tank, you see that it's not just the front portion has stuff, the back portion has stuff too. However, that effect is lost when the Rosewood Blood Anemone decided to get like cover up half the tank. Huh? Jeez, man. What the heck? <laughs> go, go pump! Go, go give Leon some milk. Just go. Just go. Go. Bye. Swing over here, take a look at the uh, green finger ladder. It is kind of touching the uh, anemone already, which is not ideal, but they seems to be playing nice, surprisingly. I do not see the polyp retracting. That is surprising, actually. Same thing over here. And one thing about this, I also have a um, funny suspicion that this guy may be sending out some stuff for chemical warfare in the in the water. I cannot prove it because there's really no way to test it. Whenever it shrinks up, uh, coral seems to react a little bit. And then uh, it'll shed its mucus, it'll, it'll kind of come back out again in a week or two, and then things are like super happy like right now again. It is really odd, it is really odd. So to combat that, I started running active carbon in a tiny media reactor in my sump, which I'll show you uh, later on. Um, and that seems to help whatever the issue this tank has, whether it's um, actually chemical warfare or like um, core nutrients. But since we're here, let's take a look here, shall we? we got some more Akans here, and thank you for Tank Addict for hooking me up with the uh, uh, Florida Recordia. I really want to try Recordia again, that's why I got a piece from him. And then if this does well, maybe we'll add more. But just like the letter coral being a poor man's SPS, I feel like Green Leon Harry uh, mushroom is a poor man's Florida Recordia, which we got in spade right here. So I pick up a lot of these guys uh, locally from a local reefers, and um, the comment I get once I posted this on Instagram is that these guys are super invasive and really aggressive. I'm counting on it. I wish it is. I wanted to spread and just cover a lot of the sand beds, right? Just so that I got like a like a, like nice field. But speaking of field. I got a backup plan as well. I got some green stop polyp. These are the same ones from the drop off tank, exact same ones. Uh, in the back, I got another strand from uh, Mr. Billy Pipes. These are actually from Dave's Nano Tank. The difference is that it does not have the white center like this right here. So for the most part, when you looked in there, it's just like a, a grass a grass field versus you see like a oh, grass field and some white centered. So a slightly different vibe, which I also like. And talking about carpeting corals that could become invasive, I also got some blue clove at the ready right here. I know a lot of people don't like them because they, they propagate so fast and the pilot will break off and just start a new colony anywhere in the tank. But I do really like these guys. I like the natural look. I like that blue color, the baby, uh, the lavender blue. Um, so I do hope that it does well. They've been holding, holding steady and really happy in the tank, just waiting to be planted onto a rock. Coming over here though, a little surprising, the Xenia were pretty much uh, out of the game. They melted from like a nice colony to like a, like a tissue, just like a blob tissue. Uh, that was when I believe I switched on to T5 and Radeon G4 Pro. I think just too much light. It was just too much light. So since then, um, for the 45 gallon tank revamped, when when I was addressing the light and flow, um, I decided to just go with the Radeon G4 Pro because I feel like it's just strong enough and much more much more controllable. We'll go into that when we talk about light and flow uh, later on. But one I noticed is that the polyps started appearing again. So maybe for Xenia's case, well, number one, of course, it's also core nutrient. Maybe it does not have enough nutrient, but I think light in this in this case also played a factor. Maybe the light was too strong, it's melting the Xenia's, but we will see. And while talking about soft corals, we of course have to touch on the two bounce mushrooms I got. So one is a Sunkiss bounce that, gave, uh, that tank addict Daniel gave to me. Thank you so much, man, you're super generous. And also um, the baby that sprouted off slightly up front. Um, this was in the 10 gallon tank actually, but as, as you know, 10 gallon tank is a little bit unstable because I think there's too many corals in there. So I started balancing it again by moving some corals out. Now that this, this tank is uh, once again on the ups and ups. So here's the baby. And back there, there's like an unnamed bounce, just like a really ugly bounce. <laughs> Should we just call it like Oscar bounce? 
dumpster bounce. I don't know. It's like that green, that green bounce right there. I've had it for a while. Doesn't do much. Just like a green mushroom with some bubbles on there, which is cool. Now, since we're talking about mushroom, let's come on over here to look at this uh, prettier cousin, the jawbreakers. So the jawbreakers, uh, let me put my finger up there for scale, has really grown in size since I started uh, on this uh, coral nutri nutrient track. I was on a mission and all the corals responded really positively. Um, and the jawbreaker, besides getting this big, there's actually also a baby down there. Um, so we got another baby down there, but it's covered up so we can't really see it. And these zoas, especially that zoa that I'm not sure of the, no, the name of, I think it's called like a pine wheel or something like that, has really popped up out of nowhere. Uh, if the coral, coral garden close up, you can kind of see there's actually a lot of cor uh, little zoas polyps in between these larger uh, pallies. I think at least I think these are pallies zoas. So, so there's actually a lot more going on underneath it uh, besides what you see up here. So in the future, when there's a chance to do a top-down shot, uh, in water top-down shot, I'll try to get them close up and we'll take a look. It's actually really interesting to see the dynamics. And the magician also absolutely exploded. The Zo basically, the Zoa Garden just really happy with the latest arrangement in terms of uh, excess nutrients. Well, no, I don't want to say excess, but extra nutrient. So I believe that um, whatever I was doing is on the right track whether it's just mostly the core nutritions or the um, chemistry or the life supports, but something, something is going on um, that they like. So that is good. And finally, let's talk about the fish real quick. The clowns, I still the clowns, they look the same. <laughs> no big news there. They're still as happy as ever. And it was ridiculous how last time the female clown jumped out of the tank just to get at me. Just how much do you hate me, man? And how about this foul fish, huh? pesty little foul fish uh, at one point I just really want to rehome them because they were stressful man like there's this guy right there and there's this guy and they're supposed to be a bonded pair but they pick at each other well the big one always chase after the little one whenever they get a little too close I'm like what's the deal but I mean they do bring a different dynamic to the tank um, they are kind of comical and recently I found a really interesting thing it's like when this guy was sleeping he was actually right here. He, he was chomping down onto the uh, mushroom. And at first I was like, is, is the filefish eating the coral finally? Because a lot of people ask and they have never eaten coral in front of me. So I, I have no reason to get rid of them. But he was chomping onto the, the mushroom. And I was like, what is going on? Turns out he was sleeping and he was just holding onto the mushroom so that it does not drift away. It's, it's the coolest thing. The other fish that I got in here, the silver belly wrasse, he started coming out at the right time now. Um, he used to come out around 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. That used to be when this tank was lit back then, but that has changed. Right now, this tank is lit between 3 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. or so. I'm still tweaking of the light setting. I'm slowly ramping up the photo period. So now he is more of the program. When the tank light is on, he's finally out. So that is good. I can actually see him, but he is a lot more skittish for whatever reason. He would not go in front of the tank when there's people around. He'll always kind of like go in the back, but when we kind of like leave the room or a little bit further away, then they'll start coming, he'll start coming out in the front. It is the strangest thing. I don't know what happened. He got traumatized by something. And I realized I did not talk to you guys about, oh, look, those are kicking off. <laughs> I realized I did not talk to you guys about uh, the Christmas tree warm rock is still back here, still doing well. I believe I still have more than ha more than half of the um, of the worms. The ones on the side seems to be gone. At least the tube seems empty. Um, so maybe the worm is eaten or died, but I don't know. I wonder if they recolonize. And you notice that I have a frag of the soft coral here because I thought the back overflow is a little empty. So let's add some form there. We'll see if it does well because it doesn't really get much light here. Uh, but the reason we're back here is because I want to show you guys that yes, Bob the Aptasia is still alive and well. Uh, he has, he has uh, getting awfully close to rock work. Uh, usually he's on the Christmas tree worm rock, which is manageable because I feel like I can always just pull him out. But once you get to the rock, it may be a little bit tougher. However, he's not really bothering anybody. And any babies that he dropped, I feel like the foul fishes pick off. So there's no problem at all. We'll just let him be. And lastly, Bubble algae. Bubble algae, I've been dosing vibrance and we'll do a video on it later on once it's all done and whatnot. You notice that the bubble algae, we started getting a silver shrin on them. So that tells me that the 
Vibrant is working. I think I'm on week five or week six now. And supposedly by like week seven or eight, it, all the bubble algae should mostly be cleared out. Uh, but I do see that I have no new bubble algae. These are all the existing large ones and they're turning silver. And I think the next thing is just, they're just gonna like drop off and just float off. Um, so that's good news. So I do believe that Vibrant is working for me for the second time. Like I've tried it once already and I know it works. That's why I'm using it. And a lot of people uh, said the same thing online. That is pretty much a nice snapshot of where the 45 gallon tank stand right now. Um, in the future, in the really near future actually, I'm gonna talk about what I did in terms of um, coral nutrition. That's something that I honestly never pay attention to. Uh, but I started doing testing, I started dosing, and oh man, the results kind of just speak for itself, at least to me, because I look at the tank every single day. Um, I'm really excited to share that with you. I don't share too much informational stuff on this channel because I, f I, I feel like I'm not the most informed guy out there in terms of reef keeping, and I don't want to steer you guys wrong. But in terms of stuff that I'm learning right now, I feel really confident about, and I got the backups of a lot of uh, really smart people that kind of confirm and help me make sure that the way I'm doing is, is right, basically. And I've been doing all the testing. So I'm really excited to share the information with you guys next. And um, it's a 150 gallon tank, man. It's actually coming. It's not vaporware, I promise. All right, with that said, I'll see you guys next Sunday at 12.30 p.m. So bye-bye. In a traffic light, I see we can crank this out real quick. So I just picked up what I came here for. Look at this, look at this.